I'm Illinois State Comptroller Susana Mendoza. Thank you for your original invitation to come to uh, Chai Hack Night. And uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, it's not the first time that I get to come before a bunch of hackers. And I say that in the best possible use of the term, right? So when people call me a hack, it's usually not in the best possible way. So I'm just saying it's kind of nice to be here amongst a bunch of hackers who are really great people trying to make great things happen with information. So um, obviously I'm excited to be here. I heard that there were awesome empanadas too, and please keep inviting me back. You know what I mean? That food was good back there. But listen, utilizing technology to improve government has been a real priority for me since taking office. Um, I started off in the legislature at a very young age. I was 27 years old when I won my first office. I spent 10 years in the state house, uh, and I saw the potential for technology to positively impact people uh, across all different constituencies in the state of Illinois. Uh, at the time, I got really interested in, in looking and thinking about technology in terms of uh, not the technology just itself, but the process and the people that are related to implementing useful and successful technologies. Uh, when I became the Chicago City Clerk, which happened in 2011, I was, uh, like I mentioned, elected uh, to the State House in uh, 2001 is when I was sworn in, uh, was elected to six terms, and then in 2011 had the opportunity to run for a citywide office as the Chicago City Clerk candidate, and I won. And I remember, prior to ever even thinking about running for that office, how many of you guys actually live in Chicago? Okay, a lot of people. And how many of you drive a car? <clears throat> Have you all purchased your city stickers? You better, because they will find you now. And in large part, I'd like to take credit for that, because um, <clears throat> before it was really difficult to find people who were not compliant with the wheel tax, but in, in in effect, people who were not compliant with the wheel tax were, you know, skirting the system. And it meant that other folks had to pay more and were paying more than their fair share in trying to keep our, our, uh, our tax base flowing. Now, when people say, why do we need this city sticker? So for all of you who have a car, the, the, and for those of you who don't, let me tell you what the city sticker is. It's a wheel tax. That's what it is. If you own a vehicle in the city of Chicago, you have to pay this wheel tax. We call it the city sticker. Because when you go to City Hall, if you were to go in person, you can now do the purchases online. It's very simple. But prior to that, let me walk you back a little bit. You'd go and you would wait in what was, on average, about a three hour long line. And you would do this in the month of June. Isn't this crazy? The whole entire city in the month of June. Now this started back in 1908, 1908. That was, it used to joke around and say, what was 1908? Cubs. Yeah, the Cubs. It was the last time the Cubs won the World Series, but now we don't have to say that anymore. It's like we might win it again, right? Yes. And we won it last year. We gotta keep the faith, guys. But prior to, when I took office in 2011, um, and I said, why on God's earth are people waiting in line for two to three hours? because it was like Great America with this long line, but there's no, ride, no fun ride at the end of it, right? You just show up and bam, they whack you with the tax. And it wasn't like a $2 tax. The cheapest sticker that we sold of a normal price range was, 70, was $60 when I started. <clears throat> and uh, so I just thought it was so horrible that people had to wait in line, a long line, to then have what oftentimes was a very unpleasant experience once you even made it to the front of the line. Not only are you paying this tax, but the people on the other side of the line might not be very friendly either because they've just had to sit through upset customers hour after hour after hour. It was not the funnest job. So I remember being in that line, not on the accepting payment line, but on the having to pay line and waiting two to three hours thinking, oh my God, like there has got to be a better way to do this. Never in my wildest imagination thinking that someday I would be the city clerk in the position to actually change that and put what I'm, you know, preaching to practice. And so when I decided to run, um, my goal was to revamp the way that city sticker was sold. Because in 1908, when they started that program, it was literally horses and buggies on the roads and just a handful of Ford Model Ts. 
new ones, and it just got in other words. Started to destroy the pavement, the cobblestones, and people started freaking out. How are we going to fix this? How can we afford it? And hence, the idea of the wheel tax was born. And people would probably saunter on over to the village hall and, you know, meet with their five neighbors that they knew in the city or something. And it was nice, and you pay your fee, and you're on your way. But 105 years later, it's still sold in pretty much the exact same way all in the month of June. 1.3 million vehicles later. So, you know, maybe in the 1908, it was not your whole day that got blown, but certainly in 2011, you were blowing your whole day. You, there's no way you could do this over your lunch break, impossible. Uh, many people, on a very serious note, had to take a day off of work, lose additional wages, utilize a vacation day, to go stand in a long line, get bad service, and on top of that, be out 75 or 85 or $60 on the low end, right? So there had to be a better way to do this. And when I came in, I thought, I'm going to utilize technology, but thinking about people first to figure out a way to do this better. <clears throat> so I wanted to focus on taking away the headache of what that was of being in that super long line. And what we did was we moved the city sticker program away from what was a just one month sales period, which is an impossible task to do with any kind of level of customer service, to what is now a year round system. And I looked at what the Secretary of State's office did, which seemed to work fine. I mean, I get my renewal once a year. It's not something I even thought about. I'd get it about a month ahead of time, go ahead and send in my renewal. You can do it online, you can do it in a kiosk, and or you could go into a center that did not have, for most you know, intents and purposes, a three hour long line. It was pretty much you could do it over your lunch break. And so I thought, how do I go from all sales in June to a streamlined year round system? And the first thing we did after that initial first year of sales, because I took office literally the day after city stickers had gone on sale for that year in May of 2011, um, we had done our you know, initial rollout of all our stickers to all the currency exchanges, and we're just ready to hit the, tr the pull the trigger on, you know, selling the, the stickers. And so all of that year's sales was already set in motion from the prior clerk. And I just had to go through it and experience this horrendous three hour, two hour, full complaints, you know, I'd stand in line shaking people's hands saying, this is gonna get better and I don't think a single person believed me. And I said, this is why I ran, we're gonna fix this thing, you just gotta be a little bit patient with me. Um, and, but in my mind, I was thinking, this is such a learning experience for me because I'm gonna understand every single touch point of how these stickers are sold, right? Because if we're going to eventually lead to a whole new system of technology, we want to be able to understand that technology is to serve a purpose of who the customer is and what the process is that it needs to actually champion in order for it to truly be effective, right? Because if you're not thinking about implementing the technology based on the people side and the process, I just don't think it's gonna work. We've seen that happen time and time again. So in my first year of a four-year term, I experienced you know, the, the horrors of the old system, full-fledged. Then immediately after the season was over, did a retreat not a fancy one, we were down in the basement full with water bugs and the whole experience, you know. No ventilation, lots of fumigation, it was not fun. But I asked people, why do we sell stickers in the month of June? Like, what's the deal with that? Can anybody tell me what the genesis is of this? And there was an employee there who had been there over 35 years and he said, well, it's just because it's always been this way, right? Like, it's, this would be impossible to change. It's, our system is so archaic. Like, it's just people are used to it. They may not like it, but they're used to it. So it's like, don't even imagine like changing this because it would be a monumental task. And, and I just remember thinking, uh, there is no way that I was gonna run for this office to just continue the status quo, right? Like, that would be the worst possible of all options. And I thought the beauty of being the city clerk is that I'm my own boss, literally you're my boss, right? It's not the people that I work with uh, so much as it is, and it's definitely not the mayor's office. Uh, we're independently elected offices. I have this ability, this unique opportunity to actually try to make things easier and better for people, and we're gonna champion technology to help us get there. 
And so um, I started putting the wheels in motion, met with every single employee that dealt with any type of touch point with our um, sales process, uh, even with the vendors that we have to deal with, you know, like improved our technology use with those folks as well. But long story short, we set the goal and the vision and then got everything in place. And that first year, so it would have been year two of my term, we utilize that as an education year. Because this is at the same time, how many of you guys have a venture card? All right, so do you guys remember, like right now it probably works fine, but do you remember when they first rolled out Ventra? Was that not like the biggest nightmare? And everyone was like, why do we even need this? Like, I don't get, what's this card for? Why do I have to change from my old card to this card? Like, what's the benefits? You call a hotline, and then um, that hotline was charging like so much money just for giving you input on what you were talking about, because it was like a credit card at first. It was just a total disaster on how it was rolled out because I think they failed on the educating the public side, right? It's like the, the government thought, well, here's a good idea, and ultimately it seems like it's a good idea, but at the time, everyone's used to what they're used to, and then there was no easy transition. It was like you go from one day, this is what you're used to, to now you have to buy this, but we're not gonna explain to you the benefits of why you should make this transition. And so I had the luxury of living through that as I was trying to think about how to roll out my transition, uh, which would be, in fact, much larger than the switch from your old CTA pass to the Ventra card, right? It's 105 years of ingrained bad service that people were used to. And so I used that as an education for me, and we said, we're gonna use this whole second year to educate the public of what's coming. And in the meantime, while we're educating them as to what's coming, we're doing the hard work behind the scenes. And I was in almost every single one of those planning meetings and design meetings and really, really wanted to sink my teeth into this so much. It was like my baby. And then, go figure, I get pregnant. So I'm actually gonna have a baby. And it's all being timed out. And around the same time, I'm thinking, I'm taking on this humongous challenge and now I'm pregnant to top it off, right? So we kept talking about the baby and everybody would ask me, which one is it, city stickers or the baby, right? Said so they both have to have a, a perfect delivery. We've gotta, you know, we can't get this wrong. Like think of my baby as this baby and we have to do this, right? With, there has to be a plan, a birth plan, right? So um, long story short, we got it done. You know, now you guys probably don't really think about your city sticker too much, or at least I hope you don't. And um, you know, there's no more lines at City Hall, and I, I would hope that the new clerk continues that same type of innovation, and I believe she will. And, and um, you know, everybody who's in any elected position is going to have their own vision, and they're gonna to wanna to implement their own things, but I certainly think we left the place a whole lot better than when I took it over. And we took the revenues from the city of Chicago, one of the reasons I was gonna say um, earlier, I started talking about why we even have this tax. There was another municipality, the second largest municipality in the state of Illinois, collected about $60,000 in revenue from city stickers. They got rid of it, it was nothing. We collect $100 million in revenue from city stickers. I mean, it is never going away. There's no way you can just say, we're gonna cut that $100 million out of our budget when it's something that's been around. So we do need it, it does go towards road repair, and there's never enough money to make sure that all our roads look the way they need to. But you can imagine if we took 100 million out, you really would be like you're in Beirut or something when you're going down your street. So it's bad enough as it is, you don't wanna make it any worse. Um, but we have taken the revenues by creating greater customer service, greater ease of use to uh, technology through the website. When I left, we were making 25% of all our sales were done online. We have a two to three day turnaround on online purchases. Um, the lines at City Hall, for those people who still want to go in person, are significantly shorter, five to 10 minutes on a bad day now. And we did all this amazing customer service on the interface side at lower cost for the city of Chicago, which sounds crazy, but to this group, I know it doesn't sound crazy because you know that if you properly use and leverage technology, you can make great things happen at much lower cost. The return on investment is huge. I projected that we would recover our return on our technology investment because we had to blow up the old system and just start from scratch. In year three of our rollout, we actually recovered our full investment in year one of our rollout 
and we ended up about four and a half million dollars above our projections for what would have been year three. Like, it was awesome. And I don't know of any other elected official who could walk into the mayor's office and say, hey, how'd you like another four and a half million bucks you weren't expecting? But to put this in perspective, I thought that was huge. By my last year in office, so I was elected to a second term, I left in year five. With, by year five, I had taken revenues and city sticker sales from $100 million when I first started to 150, five zero by the time I left. And its sticker prices have not gone up. They've been pretty steady with the exception of the CPI that they're attached to now. So every two years, you'll see your sticker go up by maybe a buck or you know less than that. But the fact that we could provide greater customer service at without having to tell you to pay significantly more or really anything more for your sticker and then generate an additional $50 million in revenue on what is now an annual basis is incredibly significant. So on the year I left, we were able to donate an additional $15 million uh, to the BAM program. Have you guys heard of that, Becoming a Man? And it's a really successful uh, program, particularly targeting the African American community. And when the mayor made his big pitch about wanting people to step up and say, hey, we're gonna try to save some money here in your market for that purpose, we gave the biggest contribution. It's your money, but we were able to come in above our expected target by $15 million from one year to the next. It's just huge. Without impacting your service, actually improving it, and not increasing the price of your sticker. So we did that while making sure that we held the line on our payroll. We actually I started with 106 employees and ended with 96. We did it by coming in under budget every single year just because we had, you know, the technology was helping us do the job so much more efficiently. Uh, we eliminated our overtime by 70% from my first year to when we left. I mean, this is all happening as a result of technology. And it was such a huge, big deal that we actually won the, the Harvard University Bright Idea Award, which was pretty cool. So, you know, there's oftentimes you feel like there's not a lot of really great or bright or awesome things happening in the city, but you'd be surprised. There's a ton of really great things. We just oftentimes only see the bad, but there's a lot of innovation and really cool things happening in the city clerk's office as well as in the mayor's office in the city, in the state. Uh, it seems like it's all doom and gloom. It's not. There's lots of reasons to be really proud to have Chicago here, certainly if you're in the tech industry, in the tech community, and, uh, and there's really awesome things happening here in Illinois. Um, now, <clears throat> when we finished that tremendous overhaul, we said, what's next, right? Because I'm not gonna sit around behind a desk. Oh, and by the way, I do like to say for all the girls in the room that not only um, did we manage to pull off the greatest transition in the history of the city clerk's office without it turning into a nightmare that you read about in the papers. It was done so well, but I managed to have a baby. Well, get engaged, get, engaged, get married, have a baby, and breastfeed for nine months and still manage to pull it off. So I'm just saying that I do think that was pretty cool considering the level of complexity involved in everything. So everything is possible. But then when we were done with that, we said, what's next? And this is where this might be more interesting to you folks. Um, my next goal, and had I stayed city clerk, my big focus would have been on overhauling our city council division. Because while most people know us for the city sticker, because it's just something that people interface with all the time, they may not know that the city clerk's office is the official repository for all of the city of Chicago's government records, the municipal records. And at the time, we were able to, with the help of our, our vendor, um, which was uh, Granigus and the nonprofit organization OpenGov, right? You guys, I'm sure, are very familiar with OpenGov. Um, we went ahead and um, teamed up, and we said, hey, what can we do? We, we launched chicagocode.org. We helped to be a part of that. And then um, we took it to the schools, different high schools in the city of Chicago, and said, hey, we want you guys to have access to all of our municipal code. Right? When other municipalities were fighting access to public records, I just thought, why would anybody do that? These records are all public when they're being debated. Right? You're debating them, people can go to hearings about the legislation, and then you get to city council, you pass it, and now all of a sudden it's private and you have to pay for it. I thought, that doesn't make any sense. It's such a scam to me. 
And so we thought, hey, look, uh, not only are, do we not do that here in Chicago, we're going to go the extra step of making a point of asking hackers to hack away. Take a look here. We're going to give you the municipal code in a way that is easily digestible to people in the technology community and the hacking community. Um, and to say, take a look at our laws, see if there's something that you think can be done better. And this is where we came up with this idea um, to um, do Envision Chicago, which is the program that we worked with with OpenGov. And other um, state leaders or mayors of other uh, cities, like New York was on board, and New Jersey, and, and uh, the mayor of San Francisco. And we were just really trying to get some key uh, stakeholders to utilize their own government records and to try to bridge the gap between kids, right? Kids know, the millennials they know and they like using computers and stuff, but at the same time, there's still lots of parts in the city of Chicago that don't have that. And certainly in minority areas, the access to technology is a lot less than what you would think it is. And certainly if you don't have access to the internet and you don't have a, a workable laptop and you know, the best thing you're gonna do is be able to use it when you're at school if you're lucky enough to even have computer time. You know, there's a whole world that is not being accessed by kids that live in this very same city. So we thought, hey, let's take this into the schools and let's create a program and a contest of sorts where we could have um, children earn scholarship money because they came up with a good idea by scouring our municipal code and then offering suggestions as to how we can improve upon things. Maybe this is a super archaic law that needs to be taken off the books. Maybe there is something that I'd like to be a law that currently is not. Pitch that idea. So we did that um, across the city and we wanted students to get used to having user-friendly touch points with technology. And so that was another element of what we did. Because at the end of the day, I think there's nothing more important to taxpayers than full transparency. Full transparency. Now I see this now in my new role as the Illinois State Comptroller. This is the most important role I've ever served in. Uh, I think the other jobs that I've had have been very helpful in helping me be fully prepared to take on the biggest fiscal crisis in the history of the state of Illinois. Um, one of the biggest reasons that I see now that, that lends to a total state of fiscal lawlessness in the state is because I, as the state's chief fiscal officer, can't even see the full extent of what our liabilities are as a state. So for those of you who may not know, the Illinois controller is supposed to pay the state's bills. That's my job, I'm the state's chief fiscal officer. Can you imagine having to cash manage or manage the debt for $16 billion worth of bills for services that have already been rendered to the state that have not been paid? So any of you that work, do you like to get paid? Right, you show up to work, you put in a good week and or two, and then you're like, okay, where's my check? So now, like, imagine that you're working in any business that does business with the state of Illinois, and you've put in your hard work, but when it's time for your paycheck, state of Illinois is not paying your boss the money that they need to pay you. And there's only so long that the boss, your boss, can actually sustain not getting paid by the state of Illinois before they are no longer able to cover your own payroll. And this has happened over the last two years because we had no budget. State of Illinois racked up over $16 billion worth of bills that have not been paid. They essentially turned the people doing business with the state into unwilling lenders, right? So it's like, if I'm not paying you, I'm basically borrowing money from you, but it's not like you wanted to lend it to me. But I've forced you into the situation. And then to add insult to injury on that 16 billion, we owe at least $900 million in late payment interest penalties on that. So how many of you guys have a credit card? All right, so can you imagine if you, let's say you wrecked up $10,000, because 16 billion is just too insane for anybody to even understand, right? It's like, what is that? Okay, 10 grand, you might be able to understand that. So imagine that when you get your monthly bill, all you see is $10,000, right? That's all it says. Would you be able to manage your finances if all that credit card bill says is 10 grand? Would you maybe want to know what you spent that 10,000 on? Would you maybe want to know when you spent it? Because the 23 or 
late payment interest penalty or the interest that you might be paying on that 10 grand, it might matter depending on how long those bills were incurred, right? This is just common sense, right? Well, the state of Illinois, out of that 16 billion that I told you about, I can only see about 9 billion of it. So I'm estimating that there's an additional X amount that gets us to 16. Now, why do I know that that's pretty accurate? Because every October, now follow me with this because it's so insane. Every October, which is now, so trick or treat, <laughs> the controller's office gets a report, a report of all the liabilities that are currently accrued and sitting at the agency level. In other words, not the controller's office. So any state agency, uh, DCFS, Department of Corrections, Department on Aging, you name it, right? There's, you know, 97 state agencies that interface with our office. So in October, by law, they're supposed to report to my office what their accrued liabilities are. So in other words, how much debt they're sitting on, how many bills they're sitting on that they'll eventually send to me for payment. Um, but I don't actually see them until they're sent to me physically, right? So you guys can see that how this process works. Um, you sign a contract with the state of Illinois, let's say it's with the Department of Corrections, you provide food to the inmates, right? Um, we're supposed to pay you on a regular basis, we never do. Um, we owe you money because you can start accruing interest because we don't pay you. And by the way, you taxpayers are on the hook for 12% interest on most of our late payments. It's obscene. Um, but because you went ahead and performed the work, you send an invoice, right? You guys all understand, you write an invoice and you send it to the person that is doing the contract with you. Then, so Department of Corrections would get your invoice. This is assuming that your contract is only with the Department of Corrections and not with multiple agencies, right? So let's keep it easy. You, you send your invoice to Department of Corrections, Department of Corrections would, would look at your one or 1,000 invoices that you sent, and at whatever their leisure is, they decide to send me, the controller, either one invoice or 20 invoices or, you know, 1,000 all at once uh, in a voucher form that I would then know is approved and that it is appropriated, which means that it's been legally signed off on by the budget process, which is what the legislature and the governor does, and that means I can pay for it legally. But it takes a long time because you can sit on those bills, you know, or I should say the agency can sit on your invoices for up to a year before I see them. So in other words, I don't even know that they exist, right? I only know that they exist come October because that's when the agency would tell me I'm sitting on X amount of millions of dollars or billions of dollars worth of bills that we have yet to send you. So just this last week, I got my trick or treat and they sent me my report and it was literally one page long for all of the state agencies. And it was like the name of the agency, there was one line with like a total amount and that's all it told me. So there's your credit card bill for 10 grand, but I have no idea what it was spent on. I'm the state's chief fiscal officer. Do you not think maybe I should tell you what we spent your money on? I'm thinking that would be very transparent and proper fiscal accounting. Um, and I also would like to know, first of all, how much is sitting in your uh, shop, crude liabilities, what the interest payments are, if any, on those payments, or on those invoices, how late those bills are, so how old they are. In other words, are they just 60 days old? Are they 30 days old? Are they 300 days old, right? This all would then tell me what, how much interest we're paying. Are we paying 9% interest or are we paying 12% interest on these liabilities? This is just common sense. I don't know any of that. I don't know any of that. That's why in October, I only know that as of this October, when I got that report, my office is sitting on nine and change billion. The state agencies are sitting on 7.5, almost $7.6 billion. But guess what? That's only current as of June 30th. So since what happened since June 30th, they're already like super old. That information is not even valuable to me because it's already outdated by the time I get it. So my big initiative right now in the controller's office is to um, actually 
just passed what is known as the most common sense legislation, but largest reform measure in like decades for the controller's office, which is the Debt Transparency Act. And that would require that the state agencies report to me not once a year, but once a month. Once a month, I want to know what their accrued liabilities are, what's the total. I want to know how much interest is associated to those, um, to those uh, invoices. So how much late payment interest penalties are we on the hook for? I want to know if those expenses are even legal. Did they happen with legal authority, or is this just additional deficit spending that we've been racking up on the credit card with no ability to pay it? Because remember, if the legislature does not give me an appropriation authority, you can sign all the contracts you want, but I can't pay those bills until I have the legal authority per the appropriation to pay them. And what I know is that at least $2 billion have been racked up in unappropriated spending over the last two years, this budget impasse. So not only were we spending, you know, we, we didn't even have a budget in place, there was no tax revenue coming in because we went from five to 3.75, but we kept spending as if that tax increase was still in place. And then on top of that, we didn't just stop there, the government spent an additional two plus billion dollars beyond our means, above and beyond the 5% income tax increase revenue that was coming in. So this has been like a terrible, terrible situation. I think the only way to begin to even fix it is to, for once and for all, know how bad it truly is. And right now I can give you a best guess estimate that it's at least almost $16 billion. But, you know, I would probably venture to say it's probably worse than that. And to give you one last idea on why this is so important, in the month of May, I thought that the bill backlog was about $12 billion, $12.5 billion. And we report that every Tuesday. I want to have full transparency. People can see what we're spending the money on and what the total amount is that's owed. This is just, by the way, in late payments uh, for payments that you know haven't been paid. It's not even dealing with the unfunded pension liability that is over $130 billion. So it's like we've lost focus on that because we can't even pay regular bills. Um, but in any event, um, the, the, the Debt Transparency Act, if we can get that thing passed, it's going to tell me a whole bunch of information that we can then utilize to begin to set up a cash management plan that can help triage you know, organizations as they're about to go out of business, help keep the lights on, give them a little bit of money, of money that, by the way, they're owed, but I can't give them in a full amount because we just don't have the revenues available to cover $16 billion worth of debt. So my office has gone from being the state's chief you could say fiscal office, to the state's main trauma center. And every day, we're just literally trying to save people's lives who are on the verge of being disconnected from their medical services like ventilators or oxygen tanks because the state of Illinois doesn't pay their insurance bills so their providers are gonna cut off service. And we're getting these phone calls and we have to like triage that and try to say, no, 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 please don't do that. We'll send you, you know, five bucks or we'll put pressure on somebody to do that. But this is no way to, to run the finances. There's no way that I can stop having to be in emergency mode every day until we can make a significant impact into that bill backlog. And by having full transparency on this whole situation through this Debt Transparency Act, it will at least, it's not gonna fix the problem, but it will at least tell us how bad the problem is so that then I can prepare better plan of attack on managing the debt and also the day-to-day -day cash flow so that we can take care of as many people who are in emergency situations as possible and give taxpayers like you at least the confidence that we know how bad the problem is so that we can now start to plan for a solution, right? It's kind of like what I did with City Stickers. It's, it's different, but it's the same in terms of identifying a problem, going through that first season of seeing how terrible the problem really was, all the ugly knots in the in the chain, and then setting up a plan to try to fix it. But if I hadn't actually seen how bad the problem was in every sector that was a touch point, I would have never been able to set the actual final vision and blueprint that we had to follow to get the job done. So I'm in 10 months into the job, I need to see exactly how bad the mess is so that we can start to fix it. I would love to say to you guys, hey, just like you did with the city council and given us ideas on how to improve the city council's flow and process and all these things, I'd love to be able to say, 
hey, can you guys hack into our system and take a look at the numbers and give us some ideas on how to like project or maybe um, you know plan for better cash flow management or debt management? I can't do that because not even I can see these numbers. And it's gonna be you know, by legislative action that we get at least some transparency, and that'll be one step in what have to be you know, many other steps to eventually get us to a point where that code is up online, not the code, but the, um, those numbers are up online in a way that would be easily you know, readable uh, and that folks can actually tackle and start to come up with some creative concepts. One of the things I'd love to do is to have people look at a trajectory or like a timeline of prior budgets and current budgets and see certain line items. For example, um, what is a better return on investment in the long term of taxpayer dollars? Because, as an example, people will say, I don't want, you know, you hear people go, I don't want my money going to a junkie. Right? You've heard this. Has anybody heard this ever? You know, like, oh, we're all perfect. And, you know, money should only go to perfect people. Nobody has real problems. You know, they all are addicted to drugs because they want it to be. It's crazy stuff. But when people say that, I say to them, okay, okay, like I'm hearing you, but let me walk you through this. Reality check is that your money is going to the junkie, to treat the junkie. It's going to treat the junkie. You're, that's where your dollars are going. Not the way you think, though. So would you rather the government take $1 out of your pocket when you're looking or 14 when you're not? Because that's what's happening. We can invest $1, for every $1 that we invest into a substance abuse treatment center to try to deal with the addiction issue, we're spending, if we don't do that, we're spending 14 in the correctional side. And we're not truly dealing with the addiction issue. It's just a repeat, you know, offenders. You see this problem over and over again. And nobody can deny that our jails are full of people who are there because of substance abuse issues or mental health issues. So, but when you look at a budget on a yearly basis, it just looks like a number on a spreadsheet, right? You're just like, okay, this is a lot of money, this is less money. But when, what would be great would be have folks like you guys to be able to look at the whole lineage or you know, a, a history of how we invest the money in every sector, which right now we can't see, and say, okay, over the lifetime of this line item, you know, it's, it's a decreasing return on investment, or this would be a really wonderful return on investment long term. This is how we would go about planning for a better Illinois, a better use of your taxpayer dollars. Why should you want me to spend 14 to fill up the jails when I could spend one and actually get the person not just to no longer be addicted, but actually not fall into a life of crime that would make it harder for that individual to actually get a job, uh, but actually fix themselves up and then be able to become productive taxpaying members of society. So, there's a lot, it's a big challenge for you guys, and we're not ready to go there yet because, like I said, I can't even see our full finances. But come October 24th or 25th, maybe I will have a happy trick or treat because the governor vetoed my bill, but I think we're going to be able to override him. And that's all I'm going to ask for Halloween this year, right? That's all. That's the biggest Snickers bar I could get, would be an override of this bill that would give me some transparency on our state's fiscal crisis so that I could do a better job working for all of you. So thank you, I know I could go on forever and I'm getting a crowbar, so it's all good. But I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks for your talk. I, I had a question, when you brought up the governor, um, I was wondering what reasons, if any, did the governor give for vetoing that bill? And how have the attitudes among the gubernatorial candidates differed in their willingness to help support you for the legislative solutions that you need so that you can see the data that you, you would need to see? Well, all of the Democratic nominees have, or not nominees, but candidates have said that they are fully supportive of this transparency initiative. And that's an important distinction because it's not just Governor Rauner who is, through his agencies, hiding the, the reality of how bad our finances are. This has been going on for decades, right? It's just never been this bad and this blatant. Um, but his veto message was that uh, this was nothing more, even though transparency is good, that this is nothing more than the controller trying to micromanage the state agencies. He like really kind of made it into more of a political hit than, than this is really good and we should do it. And my whole point is, look, this should not be a partisan issue at all. It doesn't matter if it's me introducing this or anybody else. And no, it's no secret we don't like each other. You know, I don't respect the job that he's done. I don't think he's done a good job. Um, but. Having said that, 
Um, you know, it was, it was pretty amazing that when we passed that bill on the House floor, it got 70 votes. We need 71 for a veto override. But since then, a few Republicans have actually come on board who were no's originally. They've signed on to the legislation, and some have gone as far as being lead co-sponsors on the legislation. Um, I think there's a little bit uh, more of a willingness since Governor Rauner with the whole HB 40 that people are starting to break from him and not feel as tied to him and so they can vote their conscience a little bit better. But this is an issue that should not be a political issue at all. I don't care if it's a Democrat or a Republican that's moving this forward or a Democrat or a Republican that's voting for this. If you're a member of the legislature and you're tasked with working with the governor to pass and craft a budget, how can you possibly ever get to a balanced budget if you don't even understand what the actual debt is, right? I mean, how do you pass a budget if you don't know what your true liabilities are? So I think that message has really resonated with the legislature. This is not about empowering me. It's about empowering them. It's about empowering me to do a better job managing your finances, but it's really about empowering all of you to know how your money is being spent. And that's, a, that's an issue of transparency that taxpayers deserve at the most minimum level. So. I think we're going to be successful with this override, and uh, I'm hoping that's the case. Thank you for your talk, and congratulations on everything you've accomplished. Thank you. Um, I have a question regarding the current state of um, technology. Like, what do you use currently for even looking at what you have? Yep. And do you have an interim technology plan while you try to get this legislature passed? Yes, yeah, so our systems are all very archaic. I mean, as a matter of fact, we one of the reasons why my office could not link directly when I was city clerk with the Secretary of State's office for real-time transfer of data is because our system was so much more advanced and they're still on a mainframe system, which is the case for everybody. We're dealing with COBOL, which is one of the big challenges trying to even find young people who would want to go work for the state who can really know and understand COBOL when that's, it's a very different environment today. So there's issues of uh, succession plans being very challenging for any state agency or any uh, constitutional officer. All of our technology systems are very outdated. But I would argue that um, the invoices that come in, like when it's on our side, it's not like it's super high tech. It's not, but we make it work because we have an obligation to get that information out to the public. So whatever's in my shop, we, we make transparent. If somebody calls me and says, what are you sitting on? We can make that available you know, pretty much immediately. Um, and it's more work, but it has to be done. We can't wait until we have the perfect technology system to actually show full transparency. And when people use the argument, which is one of the things that the governor said in his veto, besides that micromanaging, is that this would be too much work for his staff given the lack of technology uh, implementation that is currently the case. But I would say it's more expensive to not do this. Like, and I don't mean by revamping all the technology, I mean to just even shine a light on what our real liabilities are. Because every day that goes by without us tackling that $16 billion backlog is costing taxpayers an additional $2 million a day in late payment interest penalties. Think about that in one day, $2 million. And it's because we can't see this debt and I can't properly plan for how to manage through the, the fiscal crisis or also how to provide the biggest return on investment for our dollar when we're managing the cash flow. So, you know, it's not a perfect situation. It never will be. We still have to get the job done, though. Uh, this is really great. Thank you. I have a question uh, more. What is your stance after this kind of scenario that I give you? about public-private partnerships and really with the debt that we have, that's always what people are thinking about is, let's go get private money, 40 to one, and then we have LAZ parking mm -hmm. 100 years later. Where do you see that kind of future uh, with the city as well as with the rest of the state. So let me. Well, that's such a. It's a great question. It's so great, and I don't think it has an easy answer. I'm not trying to skirt the issue, but let me give you an example why. Because of transparency. So that parking deal probably would have never happened if taxpayers and the aldermen themselves had the ability to see it fully and clearly.
But what happened, people got it like the day before they were supposed to vote on it. There was no transparency on that. There was no ability really for the public to even understand what was happening. And it got pushed right under their noses and it's like the worst thing, right? We all hate it. And this happens every day in government. And I don't know if it's just an excuse that the government itself takes the easy route and say, well, I'll go for the quick money and we'll get out of this budget issue. They're not thinking long term and strategically. So I just got into the office, but I know what we were able to do for the city of Chicago by just using it, smart technology and working hard to make it happen. So you have to put in the sweat equity. That's what I love about folks like you. That's all you do. You're always thinking about how to fix things for like no money, right? You got like no money, but you guys are passionate about this, right? It's like, no, it's true. Like you, you have to be really passionate and believe this to champion it. And I don't think that there's a lot of elected officials in the state or even in the local levels who even know how to use their smartphone. Think about that, right? So they're like, what? What do you mean? Oh, I can put like, I don't need to put a quarter in that meter. I could use a card. What? So crazy, right? It's so insane because it ends up costing us so much more just because there's a massive brain drain of people who even understand the simplest of technology, much more like complicated things, right? So I think this issue of how do we, you know, there, there are opportunities for public-private partnerships that might make sense, but they all have to be centered around a transparent process. Take your time on this stuff. Not 10 years, but take your time on trying to learn it, and more importantly, explain it to the public as to why there are real benefits, and to, to show them that that's the case, not just tell them that that's the case, right? And so that's what we try to do with our little thing in the city clerk's office, which turned out to be a great thing. And you know how much it cost me to do that initial technology push, which this is the biggest thing that's happened in Chicago. It's made lots of people's lives very much better by not having to go through the headache. $1.7 million. It's nothing. Literally, it's nothing. $1.7 million. I recovered that in the first year, and we ended up $4.5 million up on sales, right? Like, this is just, you can do it. It can be done. You don't need to go spend $350 million on some system that you can't even show a return on investment for, just because it's a good media pop to say, I'm pro-technology. I'm going to hire all these fancy, fancy people. I'd rather hire a bunch of you guys who probably know what you're doing better and can come up with some ideas on the civic side of transparency and, and, and technology and government and then think about, okay, what's the next process, right? What's the plan? Set an actual vision that's a short term and a long term on how to get there and execute. And some of that might include good public-private partnerships, you know, but you got to actually do the homework on it. 